Hello there, Covenant class, and anybody else that might be listening. This is Steve Meeker, and this is Revelation Revealed Lesson 10. This picture of Judy and I was from last Christmas. However, today is the day before Easter, and we really miss seeing all of you in person, but we're doing the best that we can in this current situation. Because we weren't able to finish our class face-to-face, I wanted to provide the lessons for you. And so with my enormous cat, Jula, yes, I spoke to you about him in class, and no, he hasn't changed any. He's still a killing machine, but he's keeping me company in here in my home office today. So let's go ahead and jump into Lesson 10. Lesson 10 is going to cover Revelations chapters 19 and chapter 20. The primary reference I used in developing this class is a book called The Revelation of John, a Narrative Commentary by Dr. James L. Rasigi. Dr. Rasigi's book is, I believe, the most scholarly book I've ever read on any topic. It's very meaty. Uh, the references are tremendous. I highly recommend that you have it in your library, but I'll warn you, you're not going to just breeze through it. It's, like I said, very meaty. It takes some time to work your way through it. You may recall our last lesson, ending in chapter 18, which was a funeral dirge for Babylon the Great, the anti-God culture of this world. And near the end of chapter 18, we heard the mourn of those who had benefited from Babylon's grandeur, and they cried out that there was no more music, no more craftsmen, no more mill, no more light, no more bride and groom. However, we also pointed out that the New Jerusalem, which is spoken of in chapter 21, also has a connection to those words, no more. For in the New Jerusalem, there will be no more tears, no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. These two greatly illustrate the contrast the choices of Revelation, either following after Babylon the Great and the culture of this world, or following after Christ and experiencing his blessing in the New Jerusalem. As we mentioned, chapter 18 deals with the fall of Babylon from a below perspective. And now in chapter 19, we're going to see it from heaven's perspective. An outburst of praise is sung by heavenly choirs that celebrate the fall of this earthly city. This large concentration of hymns makes up the first half of chapter 19. Four different times groups in heaven include the word hallelujah in their praise. And so let's begin Revelation chapter 19 verses 1 and 2. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his saints. And so the first hymn in verse 1 is sung by a large heavenly crowd that acclaim three of God's attributes and deeds, his salvation, his glory, and his power. Two reasons are then given for rejoicing. First, God's judgments are true and just. And that echoes what the altar said back in chapter 16. And second, God has judged the great city that polluted the earth with its immoral behavior. His judgments have been avenged, have avenged the blood of his people, which answers the plea of the subaltern souls back in chapter 6. You'll recall back in chapter 6, we see on the fifth seal in heaven, the altar and underneath the altar are the souls of those who have been martyred for their testimony about Jesus. And they cry out and say, How long, O Lord, will you wait to avenge our death? Well, now that answer is come. Verse 3. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The same large choir also sings a second hymn in verse 3, rejoicing at the defeat of the mighty Babylon, whose smoke ascends forever and ever. 
Verse 4. The twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne, and they cried out, Amen. Hallelujah. And then in verse 4, the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures make their final appearance in Revelation. This is the last time that we see them. They threw themselves to the ground and worshipped God who was seated on the throne. Their posture accentuates their adoration and they utter their closing lines. Amen. Hallelujah. This is the third time we've seen hallelujah in a very short period of time. Verse 5. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Well, it's not exactly clear who this voice is, but in verse 5, an unidentified voice from the throne commands, Praise our God, all you his servants, and all you who fear him, both the small and the great. This description captures all of God's people in all segments of society. Verses 6 through 8. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad, and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. And so now the fourth and final hallelujah begins in verse 6. It is sung by a huge crowd that needs three similes to capture its deafening sound, like a great multitude, like the sound of many waters, and like a loud crashes of thunder. This crowd appears to be even larger than that one from 19 verse 1. The title Lord God the Almighty occurs seven times in Revelation. This reinforces God's complete supremacy and control over all things. So let's talk about the bride a little bit. The threefold exhortation to rejoice, be glad, and give him glory, which we saw back in verses 6 and 7, announces that the marriage feast is now at hand. The image of a wedding contrasts sharply with the illicit affairs of the whore, accentuating the two choices of the apocalypse. The bride's clothing, in verse 8, contrasts with the garments of the whore. While both are expensively dressed, the bride's fine linen is bright and pure. That's similar to those mentioned in Sardis, you remember in one of the letters back in chapter 3. The wedding dress is unsoiled and undefiled by compromise with the contemporary culture. Her spotless clothing symbolizes her spiritual and moral purity. The end of verse 8 describes the material from which the bride's dress is made as the righteous deeds of the saints. And so the bride, in fact, is the church. Verse 9 and 10. Then the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, Do not do that, for I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. This section concludes with the fourth of seven Beatitudes in Revelation. The angel tells John to write, Blessed are those who are invited to the banquet at the wedding celebration of the Lamb. It may appear a bit odd that the bride and the guest are one and the same character, the church. But the dual metaphors highlight diverse characteristics of the people of God. On the one hand, God's people, as the bride, prepare themselves for the feast by holding fast to the testimony of Jesus. On the other hand, they, as the guests, are invited to the feast by God. The metaphor captures the idea of gift and responsibility. We have been given a great gift, the gift of salvation. 
We can't do a thing to earn it. We can't do a thing to deserve it. It is mercy. It is given to us freely by Christ. However, we do have a responsibility in order to follow after him, to live for him, and to resist the influence of the culture of the world that we are living in. And so there are two sides of the same coin, gift and responsibility. The angel reaffirms that he has spoken the, quote, true word of God. But John responds by falling down and worshiping the angel. you got to love John, how he puts his own mistakes in there for us to see. The idea of misplaced worship is a major theme in Revelation. While the four living creatures and the 24 elders worship the true focus of creation, others, including John, have a proclivity to worship the creation rather than the creator. The angel issues a sharp rebuke. Do not do this. Worship God. This is a blunt reminder that the one who is seated on the throne and the Lamb have no tolerance for other gods. Revelation 19, verse 11. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. So a new section opens in verse 11 with, Then I saw heaven opened. Back in chapter 4, when we had that beautiful worship service in heaven, only a door was opened, allowing John to view in heaven. But here in chapter 19, heaven itself opens up to make way for the rider on a white horse and his troops. There are three major images of Christ in Revelation. You recall back in chapter 1, the very beginning, John sees him as one like a son of man. Then in chapter 5, that beautiful scene in which he is seen as the slaughtered yet risen lamb. Well, here in verse 19, he is the divine warrior called Faithful and True, who descends from heaven on a white horse. Now, if you'll recall again, back in chapter 4, when John sees the throne, then he sees the one seated on it. He describes the throne first, and then the one seated on it. Well, here he sees the horse first, and then the rider. The white horse is a symbol of victory. Now, it reminds us of the first horseman back in chapter 6, the first one with the seals, who had a bow and a crown, and he conquered in a traditional manner. But this rider conquers with a sword that comes out of his mouth, and with a garment that is stained in his own blood. Back in chapter 3, verse 14, Jesus is described as the faithful and true witness. Well, here in chapter 19, he is the faithful and true judge who wages a just war. In contrast to the beast and its allies that wage war in an unjust and violent manner, Christ judges and makes war in righteousness. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. Wow, there's a lot packed in to verse 12. It's a short verse, but there's quite a bit of uh, information there, so let's dig into it. Starting with his eyes. An important trait of the warrior is reaffirmed by a simile in verse 12. His eyes are like blazing fire. This was also mentioned back in chapter 1 when John first saw him. And also in chapter 2, it was mentioned in one of the letters. Christ's blazing eyes demonstrate the ability to penetrate beneath the falsehoods and lies of this world and reveal what is true. This is the second part of his name in verse 11. While the seven eyes mentioned in chapter 5 accent the Lamb's ability to see all, the fiery eyes here suggest Christ's ability to see beneath the pretense and falsehoods of this world. Jesus wages war against the falsehoods and the lies of the beast that distort the truth of God's good creation. And now on his head are many crowns. The word diadem, or crown, appears only three times in the New Testament, and all three are in Revelation. Now, back in chapter 12, verse 3, 
the dragon appears with seven diadem crowns. In chapter 13, the beast has ten. However, here in chapter 19, Christ the warrior is said to have many diadems, incalculable, innumerable, more than you can count. Despite the great pretenders claim to rule over this world, Christ's plethora of diadems trumps their pretensions and affirms his unique sovereignty. Still in verse 12, in addition to the many diadems, Christ also possesses a mysterious name that no one but himself knows. This suggests an aspect of his being that eludes human understanding until it is revealed. There's a writer that was quoted by the author of our book. His name is Robert H. Mounts, who said that there will always remain a mystery about Christ that finite minds will never fully grasp. This is also the first of three references to names in a short span. He is called the Word of God in verse 13, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords written on his clothing and on his thigh in verse 16. Verse 13, he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the Word of God. So let's talk about this blood a little bit. There is some debate among biblical scholars over the source of this blood. Does it come from the enemies that this warrior has defeated in battle? Or is it from the blood that the warrior himself shed on the cross? The first explanation would appear to agree with Isaiah 63, 1 through 6, because in verse 15, John mentions the winepress of the fury of God's wrath. Others argue, however, that this description actually occurs before the battle is described. They say that John has turned upside down the familiar divine warrior imagery of Isaiah. Christ's garment is stained with blood before the battle because the victory has already been won on the cross. Now, if you recall back in chapter one, when John first sees the vision of Christ, he sees this sword protruding from his mouth. The position of the sword on Christ's body lets us know that this is no ordinary battle. Rather than being attached to his side or held in his hand, the sword comes out of his mouth, emblematic of God's counterintuitive ways of conquering. Victory is achieved not through traditional warfare, but through the testimony of the Lamb. This is reinforced by the second name that he receives, the Word of God. Rather than traditional weapons, his powerful word is the ultimate battle weapon. Is there a more powerful force in this universe than the word of Christ? No, there's not. You re uh, recall back in the Gospels when they, the disciples were out on the lake and Jesus was asleep in a boat and a big storm comes up. They wake him up saying, Master, Master, we're going to perish. And what does he do? He speaks, peace be still. And there was instant calm the powerful words of Christ. There is nothing else that is as formidable as that. Verse 14, the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. So now with heaven wide open, its armies follow Christ on white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and pure. Verse 14, their clothing is the same as the pure linen garments of the bride, although their robes are described as white, not bright as the bride's was. White is the color of the multitude's garments back in chapter 7, the sealing of the saints. You'll recall the scene that we saw them in heaven wearing white garments. And also of the martyrs in chapter 6, the ones that are under the altar. It's also the dress of the victors at Sardis and Laodicea in the letters back in chapter 3. The armies follow the warrior wherever he goes. These are apparently those faithful Christians mentioned in chapter 7 who have bleached their robes in the blood of the Lamb. They wear the same pure white linen as the bride. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. 
So now that sharp sword that we saw back in chapter 1 and also in chapter 2 is Christ's speech and testimony that slays the falsehood of this world. A more powerful weapon than the beast's lies and deception which crumble and fall when confronted by truth. The iron scepter reminds us back to chapter 12, verse 5. You remember when the child was snatched away, uh, snatched away to heaven uh, for protection, and there was a reference to the iron scepter there. So the woman gave birth to the son, a male child who was going to rule over all nations with an iron scepter. Her child was suddenly caught up to God and his throne. Verse 16, on his robe, and on his thigh he has this name written king of kings and lord of lords the title king of kings and lord of lords appears on his outer garment and on his thigh it appears in both places as a testimony to his universal sovereignty Unlike the beast in chapter 17, verse 3, who is full of blasphemous names, as if the pretension of divine titles affords it power, Jesus' name is both on his outer garment and on his person. He is, through and through, the true sovereign of the universe. Amen. Verse 17 and 18. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in midheaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of commanders, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, and small and great. So the phrase, then I saw, introduces a new section beginning in verse 17. The great supper of God stands in marked contrast to the marriage supper of the Lamb that we saw in 19 verse 9. Whereas the Lamb's banquet is a joyful celebration of the union of the Lamb and his bride, the great supper of God is a gruesome parody in which the guests are on the menu. The guest list includes all segments of society, the small and the great. The birds gather to eat the flesh of each group, each repetition sounding like a death knell. The list appears to exclude none except those who attend the other feasts mentioned earlier in this chapter. As we have said, you either have the seal of Christ are the mark of the beast. There is no third option. If you have the seal of Christ, then you go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. But if you do not, you go to the great supper of God and you are on the menu. Revelation 19, verse 19 through 21. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assemble to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which came out of the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. And so in verse 19, the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies assemble to wage war against the rider on the white horse and his armies. We saw them preparing for this back in chapter 16. Yet no battle is described, for the outcome has already been decided by the rider with his blood-stained garment Christ's death and resurrection has already won the decisive battle. With the end near, the beast and the false prophet are put into their proper place. The disorderly world is ordered by the Messiah who puts them into the lake of fire. 
Now next, uh, in just a little bit, in uh, chapter 20, verse 10, we're also going to learn that this lake of fire is the final destination for the dragon, for death, and Hades, as well as all whose names are not written in the book of life. Verse 20 gives us an aside about those who were deceived by the false prophet. It states that they received the mark of the beast. Thus, they took it on voluntarily. They are active in their acceptance of this deceit. In addition, they worship the beast's image. It wasn't forced on them. They received it. They took it on voluntarily. The chapter ends in verse 21 by detailing the deaths of the kings of the earth and their armies. This was not a prolonged battle. They were simply killed by the sword that extended from the mouth of the one who rode on the white horse. The testimony of Jesus. His words were powerful enough to instantly end the life of the mighty earthly kings and armies. And the birds of prey gorged themselves on their flesh. A very Hitchcockian scene for sure. So now we enter Revelation chapter 20. Verse 1, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. The loose ends of the apocalypse are resolved in chapter 20, when everyone and everything is put into their proper place. Chapter 20 begins with John's statement, Then I saw an angel descending from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the abyss and a huge uh, chain. The angel's key to the abyss symbolizes his authority over that part of creation. This marks the final descent of Satan. He began in heaven in chapter 12. He was thrown to the earth and now is thrown to the underworld. His expulsion from heaven and earth dramatized his total and complete defeat. Verse 2 and 3. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss, and shut it, and sealed it over him, so that he would not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. The verbs in this section highlight the power of the arresting angel. He seized Satan, bound him for a thousand years, threw him into the pit, and locked and sealed the door. Satan is locked up for a symbolic period of a thousand years, which occurs six times in the first seven verses of this chapter. All the occurrence of a thousand years in the New Testament are in Revelation, with the exception of 2 Peter 3.8, which says a day with the Lord is like a thousand years. A thousand years is as a day. The time of Satan's lockup coincides with the saints' reign with Christ. The millennium ties together some of the loose threads of the plot. The martyred saints cry of, How long? And the promise to the conquerors of Laodicea that they will have a place on Christ's throne are realized in the saints' reign with Christ. So what is the meaning of the millennium? Why are we going to have this thousand-year period of time? Well, many of the popular questions asked about the thousand-year reign of the saints remain unanswered. Do they reign in heaven or on earth? Why is Satan bound only to be released? Who are the nations the devil deceives at the end? Whom do the saints rule? Evidently, John was not interested in these details, but rather, he wants us to see the importance of the millennium. The meaning of the millennium is that it celebrates the victory of the saints over the beast. Throughout the entire apocalypse, the call to endure, persevere, and hold fast to the faith of Jesus is embedded within the narratives of distress Christians have lost their lives because of their testimony for Jesus. From an above point of view, God's ways are vindicated, and the martyrs are victorious. This is the meaning of the millennium. It celebrates the victory 
of the saints over the enemy. Now we have a little bit of controversy here in the next three verses. And so we're going to look at three different versions of verses four through six. This first one is the King James. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads are in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part of the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Here are the same verses from the NIV, and it reads fairly similar to the King James. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands. Now I'll stop right there. The reason this is a little controversial is because it seems to indicate that only the ones reigning here are those who have been martyred. Here it says beheaded. So is that an accurate reading of this section? So both the King James and the NIV seem to indicate that the ones reigning here are only those who have been martyred. However, the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, which we're going to look at here, has a little bit different take on it. And I will tell you that the NASB has the reputation for being the most accurate translation of the ancient Greek. And so let's see what it says. Verse four, then I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had not worshiped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So in the NASB, we have that addition of and those. This indicates that it's not just those who have been martyred, but it's all Christians that will be part of the thousand year reign. This is a quote from Dr. Rasiji's book. There are considerable discussion about Revelation 24 through six. Will all Christians reign for a thousand years or only those who have been martyred? The inclusion of the word those in verse four indicates that all saints will be included in this group. This view is more in agreement with 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 and 3, which says, Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? And so it seems like that's a better understanding that the word with the word those in there, indicating that it's not just martyrs, but it is all saints, all Christians will be part of this thousand year reign. Verse seven and eight. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. So let's talk a little bit about Gog and Magog. After the thousand year reign of the saints, Satan will be released from the prison in the abyss that was mentioned back in verse seven to go out and deceive the nations. Even though the saints have been reigning for a thousand years, evil is still lurking in the underworld. Satan deceives the nations into following him into a battle symbolized by Gog and Magog. So who are they? Well, we got to go back to the Old Testament to figure that out. Gog is a prince of the land of Magog described in Ezekiel 38, 17 through 23, 
who attacks the people of Israel in latter times. The attack fails, and Gog is defeated. Well, in Revelation, Gog and Magog represent the nations of the earth that wage war against the encampment of the saints. In Dr. Rusigi's book, he quotes another author named David Guzik about the thousand-year reign, and I like this quote. He says, in this, we see more of the important reason God has for the millennial kingdom and allowing this final rebellion. For all of human history, man has wanted to blame his sinful condition on his environment. Quote, of course I turned out the way I did. Did you see the family I came from? Did you see the neighborhood I grew up in? With the millennial kingdom of Jesus, God will give mankind a thousand years of a perfect environment with no Satan, no crime, no violence, no evil or other social pathology. But at the end of the thousand years, man will still rebel against God at his first opportunity. This will powerfully demonstrate that the problem is in us, not only in our environment. Very good quote, really interesting. Verse nine, and they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. So after the millennial reign, Satan is released and he gathers an army for a final attack on the saints of God. From the four corners of the earth, Satan gathers an incalculably large army to attack on the broad plain or breadth of the earth, the encampment of the saints and the beloved city. The use of the word camp here calls to mind once again the children of Israel and their wilderness journey in Exodus. We've talked many times about the uh, parallels between Exodus and Revelation. Despite the huge army, the saints are protected from attack. Fire from heaven descends and consumes the army, vividly signifying divine intervention and evil's demise. Now, the beloved city mentioned here is not identified by name. And this is the only place that that's found. It indicates that this is different from all other human places. Now, some see it representing Jerusalem, but it's more likely a metaphor for the community of believers as God's beloved. The story of evil's demise is multifaceted and complex, with each war underlying a different ideological point of view concerning the conflict between good and evil. We've seen the fall of Satan in chapter 12, the Battle of Armageddon mentioned in chapter 16, and the battle where the beast and its army are defeated in chapter 19. This battle sets the final stage for Satan's disaster. Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. Satan, now called the devil, is snagged and thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where his accomplices, the beast and false prophet are imprisoned. Death and Hades will soon be joining them, along with all those whose names are not in the book of life. The lake of fire is the second death, a place of torment, day and night, forever and ever. Verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. The starkness of this scene is striking. The throne's greatness refers not only to its size, but to the majesty of its influence. It stands unchallenged in supremacy at the end. There is no place to hide from the one seated on the throne, as all boundaries between God and humanity are removed. Revelation chapter 20, verse 12 and 13. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. 
and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Regardless of their rank and social status, the great and the small stand before the throne. None are so great that they could escape God's judgment, and none are so small that they will be overlooked. Books are opened that detail the deeds of the great and the small and everyone in between. The sea, along with death and Hades, surrender their dead. Death is the state of the dead and Hades is the place of the dead. And Jesus holds the keys to both of these. That was declared back in chapter 1. These two are finally dismissed to their proper place, the lake of fire, the second death. Most Bible scholars believe that Christians will never appear before this great white throne. It isn't because we can hide from it. No one can. The idea is that we are spared from this awesome throne of judgment because our sins are already judged in Jesus at the cross. We don't escape God's judgment. We satisfy it in Jesus. Verse 14 and 15. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And so finally, those whose names are not written in the book of life, those who have rejected God's salvation, are thrown into the place that was prepared for the devil and demons. It was not intended for men to go there, but they condemned themselves by rejecting the call of Jesus. This is really sobering for all of us because we all have family and friends, loved ones, people who we know, people who we care about that are not ready to face this judgment. People in our families that have not accepted Christ. And so let's keep those in our prayers and keep them in mind as we pray now. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful to you that you care about those that we care about, even more than we care about them. We're thankful that you can be where we can't be, that you can do what we can't do. And Lord, we ask that you would work in the lives of our loved ones that would continue to draw them to you. We ask that you give them a road to Damascus experience if that's what's necessary for them to surrender their lives to you. Bring people by that would effectively point the way to you. We're thankful that you can be where we can't be and that you can do what we can't do. And we put it into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. The journey to the new promised land, the new Jerusalem, is nearly complete. The next two chapters will describe the arrival of the new creation and its breathtaking beauty. Our final lesson, chapters 21 and 22, the new heaven and the new earth. Folks, thank you for joining us for this lesson. Pray for all of you. Keep safe. And we will see you soon, I hope.